seated. Okay, kids, come on down or come up. I'm coming down. You're coming up. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, those are awesome. I love those. Okay, so something special is coming on Thursday. What is happening on Thursday, Nora? It's Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving on Thursday. It's getting close to Christmas. You're right. It's getting so close. Uh, Thanksgiving is a time when we're able to celebrate what we're thankful for. And so I am thankful for all of you. So I've brought you a special treat today. Oh, thank you for telling me. Thank you, Dallas. So thank you. Yes. So, you know, God really likes it when we say thank you. And I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible today about when Jesus did an amazing miracle. There were 10 people who came to him, and they all had a disease called leprosy. Leprosy makes your skin yucky, and sometimes it even makes parts of your body come off. So it was a very, very bad disease. And so in our Bible here, in Luke 17, verse 11 is where it starts. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. That means they were healed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So out of the ten people, how many came back to say thank you? Only one. Only one came back to say thank you. The Lord was glad this man had come back to say thank you. But I'll bet he felt a little sad that none of the others said thank you. But Jesus, he's full of mercy. So what did you say, Colin? Yeah. So he didn't put leprosy back on the other guys or punish them for forgetting to show gratitude. He was certainly happy that the one man had come back. And you know, it's easy for us maybe to think that this is a little sad or assume that we would do the right thing and say thank you if um, Jesus healed us. But how often do we forget to say thank you? God gives us great things in our lives every single day. Every blessing we have, every breath we have comes from him. We should say thank you all the time, every day, but sometimes we do forget. We might be more content if we're, we reminded ourselves to tell God to say thank you for every good thing and even the not so good things too. The Bible tells us to pray and give thanks in all circumstances. You will also get a little card today, and it's a thank you note, and it's blank. And it's for you to write a thank you on to give to someone. It might be your mom or your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, anybody. You could tell them thank you. Sometimes we do forget. Not only should we give thanks to God, but all of the others around us too. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for the words of the Bible. Help us remember that every good thing comes from you and bless one another. Thank you for your love. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us.
That was loud. Welcome, everyone. I am glad that you're here with us. And if you are new, especially welcome. Uh, if you're watching for the first time online, uh, I'm glad that you're able to tune in. If you have noticed, Amanda has been walking around with a camera, a very fancy camera, taking pictures. She really likes this church so much. She went out and bought that camera so she could put up pictures on her Facebook page. That's how much she loves this church. Now, actually, what's going on is we've got a new uh, website that's going to be launched. Uh, hopefully, it'll be up and running this week. Uh, we're excited about it. It's going to be uh, uh, fbcmawikwa.org. fbcmawikwa.org. My email is going to be chris at fbcmawikwa.org. And I think, Seth, is that live now? Okay, so you can get a hold of me there if you'd like to. So uh, your pictures are going to be up there if you don't want them up there. If you don't want to see your face on our, on our new website, just let us know afterwards and we'll make sure that they're not. If you haven't, I don't know if this was already announced or not, but if you haven't done so, we've got some release forms out in the foyer. Uh, we actually kind of need to have those signed. It's just, a, it's real quick. Just put your name and address there and sign, hey, we can use your pictures. Uh, and that's good for, for the website and for social media and things like that. So that'd be great. We don't want to use stock photos. Those are kind of cheesy and weird. Um, we just want to, we want to be able to show the world who we are uh, at this church. Um, show, the, show the welcoming church that we really are. Um, I haven't, I haven't said this in a while. Uh, we encourage that you, that you check in on social media and, and let people know, let your friends and family know that, we, that we're here. Uh, I, I think that's a, a real easy way to invite people without actually having to do it um, so that they can see, hey, you know, th they're checking into this church all the time and, and it's really, it, it really looks inviting and cool. Maybe, maybe I'll go join them and check it out. Um, so I encourage that, that you do that. Um, uh, this week, if, if you haven't noticed, I've done something different. If you pull out your notes um, that, that you follow along with and... I've noticed this as I'm, as I'm speaking. I'm listening to people kind of rustling through their Bibles. And I, I always put the, uh, the verses up on the screen, but by the time I get through it, maybe you haven't found it yet. At the very bottom is the scripture that I'm going to be using in order that I'm using it. So if you want to read along in, in your Bible, you can, you can look those up ahead of time. I use the English Standard Version, so that way you know. If you want to look up, Ahead of time, you can do that. Let me know maybe later if that was helpful for you, if it didn't matter. And if you want, I can keep doing that every week. So there's, there's that. Uh, last week, we uh, started a new series, just a, just a two-week mini-series uh, called Identity. Now, last week's sermon was based on Psalm 139, and it was uh, verse 13 and 14. We were formed in our mother's womb. God knitted us together. He made us individually. He didn't make a bunch of carbon copies. He made all of us unique. And so that's what we talked about last week. And uh, it's true. We are wonderfully made. We got jokesters around here. They, I overheard them talking about loosening this thing up on me, so I don't mind me. See? Uh-huh. It, it's not done. All right. So we're taught that from a very young age, and today we're going to actually focus on what the world says about us. We're going to focus today more on, on the influence that we receive from others in the world and how to navigate through that. We're going to focus on that, but before we do, let's pray. Let's go before the Lord. Dear Jesus, thank you for our identity in you. Thank you that we are fully in you. Thank you that we don't have to worry about what others say. Thank you that we can rely just on what you say. I pray that whatever identity burden that we may have brought in with us to church today, Lord, I pray that we are able to just lay it down at the foot of the cross. Lord, I ask that we would be able to open up our hearts and open up our minds to what we hear today. And I ask that as we go uh, through the rest of this week today, or the rest of this week, and, uh, and forward, Lord, I ask that we would just be able to uh, put all of those fears and all of those thoughts aside and focus more on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
we are people that are easily influenced. We are people that are influenced by others, and we influence others all the time. Whether we know it or not, we do it. We do it subconsciously, and sometimes we do it consciously. Sometimes we purposefully influence others. So much of who we are today is, in, is because of who uh, influenced us. I read an article uh, of pediatrics from the Mayo Clinic, um, and this was, uh, what they said was the age of 0 to 18 months is the age of trust versus mistrust. Babies kind of figure out their basic needs at that time. They figure out who they can trust. This, this big human is giving me what I need to survive. They're giving me food, and I can trust that they're going to give me what I need to sustain life. If you're a parent, you understand that. You get it. Okay? And if you're, and if you're not a parent but have been around children, you understand the kids that have gotten what they need from a trustworthy source. You understand the ones that have gotten it. And the ones that, and it's not, it doesn't just end at 18 months. It goes into toddler years. And, and you know the ones that have been neglected because they don't necessarily act the way they ought to act. This is very, very important during that age. There's a real bonding that happens at that young age between the, par- between the child. And maybe it's not a biological parent. It could, be a, it, could, it could be a guardian. It could be a grandparent. There's a lot of grandparents out there that raise children. And so it's a very, very important age. Parents and grandparents, it's very important that we pour truth and love into our children and grandchildren, and we teach them what God says about them. Paul said this in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, about parenting. Let's see if we can get this on the screen. He said this, fathers do not provoke, and we can say fathers and mothers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He's saying we should not raise, or we should raise our kids to know Jesus. We, or they should know that their their identity is in Jesus. And David wrote this psalm, uh, Psalm 103, that we should be compassionate towards our children. This is what it says in in, uh, 103. As a father shows compassion to his children... As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. In a few minutes, I'm going to tell you a story of a father's compassion that's going to go along with this a little bit. But so much of our identity, so much of it, specifically what we struggle with stems from when we're young. I think any of us that struggle with something in life can, can really go back to when we were kids. We can, it can go back to to experiences that we had when we were young that has followed us all the way up into our adult years. We lacked what we need as children or maybe even as adolescents because guess what? Our parents are not perfect people. Our parents are not perfect, and it's not their fault. It is not our fault that our parents are not perfect They were not able to give us all of the love and affirmation that we needed. Our parents are sinners too. The people around us that shaped us aren't perfect. And maybe you're feeling that too as a parent. Like, I mess up all the time. Like, I missed it. My son or daughter did this and and it's like Monday morning quarterbacking. Like you know what, I missed this, I should have done this, and I should have done that. But we're sinners. And then we grow up and think, you know what, my life is going to be so much better because I'm going to meet that perfect person. And I'm going to get married, and I'm going to just have a do-over. I'm going to have a do-over. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet that perfect spouse. Well, I got, I got news for you. It doesn't work that way because you are going to find that person and everything's going to be great for whatever that honeymoon phase is. 
and then marriage is tough. That one's free, by the way. That one's free. Okay? You can skip the first counseling session with me now. Because we expect that our spouse is going to fill us up. And they're going to expect that we're going to fill them, fill them up. And we're broken people too. And we can't. We don't have what they need. And they don't have what we need. And then we're going to argue about it back and forth. And so we're going to go on. And we're going to get depressed. Because our parents let us down. And our kids let us down. And our spouses, they let us down. And we're going to find ourselves in this vicious cycle of measuring our self-worth based on how much affirmation that we receive from others. And when we don't get it, we find ourselves blaming people because we fall short in places in our lives. Our first point this morning is me buying a new clicker self-worth. Last week, we showed a video of a woman describing, or women describing themselves to a crime scene artist. Remember that video if you were here last week? So there was a crime scene artist, and uh, he didn't get to see the woman, but he drew, drew uh, herself explaining, or, or she, she described herself to this man, and, and he was drawing a picture of her, a portrait of her, and then she left, and then somebody else, a perfect stranger, came in and described the same woman to this crime scene artist. And the two portraits were very different. You see, the woman, when she was describing herself, saw herself in a much different way, and it wasn't as attractive. Her whole life, she thought of herself as much less. She thought of herself as a less person because she was probably described as, as less because of her outside appearance or the way people thought of her. This was all external stuff. The woman described herself as less attractive. You see, we are only seen for our outside appearances. When people see the outside of us, They can see and judge only our self-worth by our outside. Peter says this. 1 Peter 3, 3. Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold and jewelry or clothing that you wear. But let your adorning be hidden. Be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight, which is in God's sight is very precious. Don't dress yourself up on the outside to impress others. When we're concerned with the outside, that's for people. People can only see what's on the outside. If you heard the saying, I like their heart, they've got a beautiful heart, that people can't see your heart. They might be referring to that you're a nice person or you're kind or, you're, or, or they've been nice to you. But people can't actually see your heart. Only God can see your heart. And that's what, and that's what God is after. Remember the story when, when God sent Samuel to Jesse's house? He was searching for a king. He was searching for a king. Lord said to Samuel, and we're going to... We're going to look at 1 Samuel 16, 7. God said, do not look at his outside appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We judge people by what we can only see. We only can see people from the outside. Sometimes we can judge people on how they treat us, but generally we're always looking at on the outside. It's like when we apply for a job. We always put our best foot forward. 
We fill everything out on our resume, our application, and what are we putting on there? We're putting on there everything that they can see because we want that interview. We want to be able to explain to them what they can't see. We're going to put down on there our experience. We're going to put down on there our, our references. Hopefully, they're not going to look up the bad ones, right? But, but what can't we put there? We're, we can't put there our, our ethics. That's not things that you can see. We, we can't put there our morals, and we can't put there how we're going to really, truly benefit their company, how long we're going to stay with them, our personality. We can't put there a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. We want the ability to be able to get that interview and talk with them. So we're going to put everything out there, and we're going to have a really nice, colorful resume, maybe even put our smiling face on there dress up nice, put a suit on, so that we can get that interview. If you're following along in your notes under our first point, our self-worth is not found on the outside. Our self-worth is not found on the outside. God looks at the inside. He makes us all different and unique. God has set us apart, made us individually, and God loves us exponentially. Best of all, God's love is never ending. See, we're people. That's not true. This brings us to our next point. Our next point is our need for affirmation. We need affirmation. We need endless affirmation. We were created in the very beginning for endless love and affirmation. We were created in the Garden of Eden to be with God forever. And God was going to give us that endless love and affirmation. It was never going to end with him. But that isn't how the story ended, is it? When we left the Garden of Eden and we weren't with God all the time, we didn't have that endless love and affirmation with him. When we were set apart from God. And so we were now looking for it. And, and we were looking for it now with other people. See, when Adam and Eve had their eyes set on God and had that endless love and affirmation, they turned to each other. And they started looking for it in each other, and it wasn't there. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 2, 1, 21 and 22. He said, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. He has anointed us. And who has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. What a great reminder that is. God has put a seal on us. He has established us through Jesus. In our notes under point number two, God has affirmed us in Christ. That affirmation is never ending through Jesus. Yet, if you don't have Jesus, you're constantly going to be looking for that love and affirmation. And so that's why people in the world are just chasing it and chasing it and chasing it. And they're never going to find it fully. While on earth we do receive compassion from people and loved ones, that does help shape who we are. Compassion is one form of affirmation. Earlier I mentioned Psalm 103, how a father shows compassion. That is one form of affirmation. And that's why David said that we do need as fathers to show compassion. I told you that I was going to tell you a story about affirmation through compassion. And the Greek word for compassion is symponia. And compassion also means to have sympathy or to have mercy. And that we do need to have sympathy and mercy. When you were a kid, do you ever remember driving around the back roads with your parents before you had the driver's license? I'm not, I'm not talking about sitting on the lap of your dad's steering. I mean, you had the pedals too. This was 
Mom or dad took you out on the back roads and said, all right, you don't have a driver's license yet, but I'm going to teach you how to drive the car before you go to driver's training so you have a clue. Remember? Sorry, I'm not a police officer. You can tell me. Remember? All right. Well, I remember I was 13, 14 years old, I think. My dad said, all right, let's go. Let's go out on the back roads and let's drive the car. I remember it was, a, it was a Delta 88, an old Delta 88, a Burgundy. I mean, you could land a plane on the hood of this car, right? <laughs> this thing was a boat. And I was so happy. I, he, out of the blue, said that let's do this. I didn't ask him. I felt like I was king of the world. Now, my dad was in the car, and it didn't matter, but I got to drive the car. I mean, it was a little bit of a learning curve with power brakes. I think I sent my dad through the windshield a couple times. But it was, it was just the most amazing feeling. And I got to drive. We went a few miles. We came back. I did a good job. I kept, kept it right on the road and came back. A couple days later, I wanted to go again. I was bugging him about it, bugging him about it. And he's like, no, 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 maybe a couple days later, you know, we'll, We'll do it later. What, I don't remember what he said. So we'll do it. He just kept pushing me off, right? Well, Dad, he decided to go down and take a nap. So I took the keys. And got in the car. And I remembered that the R meant to back it up and the D meant to go. And I got the car out of the driveway. And I went. And I don't know what I was thinking, the whole thing, I don't know what I was thinking. But my cousin lived about 20 miles away. And I was going to my cousin's house to take him for a ride. And I got about three miles down the road. And boom! I had no idea what happened and where it came from. And I got out of the car. The whole grill was smashed. The hood was smashed. Fender, blood everywhere, and a dead deer on the side of the road. That was the first time in my life I seriously considered running away from home. There was enough gas in the car, and it was drivable. I wasn't going back. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I, but I knew I wouldn't survive on my own. I was 14 years old. What was I going to do? So I turned around and I went home to find my dad sitting on the porch waiting. And I got out of the car and I walked up ready to tell him the story that I'd been rehearsing in my head over and over the whole way back. I got out and I said, Dad, and he said, stop. I don't want to hear it. Go to your room. We will talk about this tomorrow. I said, okay. So I went to my room. Isn't that a lot how God is sometimes? You mess up so bad. And you have rehearsed in your mind over and over and over again what happened to justify what you did? And you're like, Lord, and you just feel a, I don't want to hear it. And you, and, and you just want God to smack you across the head. And you just want instant punishment so that it can just be over with. And that's not what happens. I wanted my dad to just level me and it be done. But he didn't. All night long, I sat in my room, and he never came down. He never talked to me. He didn't speak to me. That was the worst punishment. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. We want answers right now. Dad, yell at me for wrecking your car. Wife, yell at me for the stupid thing I did. Or praise me for the great thing that I did. But we don't get it sometimes. I need it now, but that isn't how life works. And when we don't get what we want right now, when we don't feel affirmed in the things that we have done right or done wrong, we start shifting blame. 
we start doing the blame shift. In our notes and under uh, number two, <clears throat> I think I went past that one. God has affirmed us in Christ Jesus. I don't know if I put that one or not. But we start doing the blame shift. We shift blame to others when we don't feel like we've been treated like we should. When we have failed at something, it becomes somebody else's fault. When we feel like others should have answered us or feel like others should have, have reacted a certain way or we even feel like God should have responded to us a certain way. We feel like it's somebody else's fault. When we have messed up, we feel like there's a reason. We start coming up with excuses. And so I didn't do this. There's a reason for this. It's somebody else's fault. My parents should have been better parents if they were, I wouldn't be struggling right now. I've fallen short because I haven't been given what I needed in life. We've heard that before. But all night long, I sat in my bedroom waiting for my dad to come and talk to me. The next morning when I woke up, I went to the kitchen and he was sitting there drinking coffee. Didn't say anything. And I walked past him. I grabbed some breakfast to turn around and eat it in my room. And as soon as I left the, the kitchen, he just said, son. I turned and I said, yes. He said, come here. And I did. He stood up and he wrapped his arms around me. And he hugged me. And he said, I love you. And I am so happy that you didn't get hurt. And I wept and wept and wept. And he said, I think you've learned your lesson on this. I said, yes, Dad, I did. And he said, you're still fixing my car with your own money. I said, yes, Dad, I will fix your car. But Jesus is the same way, isn't he? He still loves us after we've messed up so bad. But that doesn't mean there isn't a cost involved when we make a mistake. My dad didn't just excuse it and fix the car. That day I was calling body shops and finding parts and looking into the piggy bank and the, and the savings account that I had and mowing a lot of lawns that summer to pay for my dad's car. It was part of the learning experience. But I respected him a lot differently after that. And it's something that I really learned as a father on how to deal with situations. But while we're on earth, it's tough to completely ignore what people say to us. It's hard to push away what the world says about us Remember this verse in Galatians 1.10, for I am now seeking the approval of man or God, or am I trying to please? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, would I be a servant of Christ? Though our responsibility and mannerisms, I'm sorry, though our personality and mannerisms are formed by people, we don't need to seek the approval of others. Our mannerisms and personality are built by people. But our approval doesn't need to come from man. So much of who I am today is built by my mom and my dad. So much of how I parent today came from my mom and dad. But I don't need to seek approval from other people. Under point number three, we need to stand firm in who we are in Christ. We need to stand firm in what we believe in who we are in Christ.
The most stressful time of the year is right now. The most traveled day in the United States is the day after Thanksgiving. Everybody is running around like crazy trying to meet with family and friends. And there's so much pressure on us to be the best of the best and have the cleanest house and, and the best Thanksgiving dinner. And, and fortunately, as a pastor, I get invited, we get invited by everybody, and we've had a, a lot of uh, potluck, so we've been taking notes. But, but, but you understand that there's, there's just all this pressure to be sometimes somebody that you're not. I've got I've to I've be like my brother or I've got to be like my sister or my dad has never approved of me and now I've got to show up and, and be somebody I've not. I've heard of people actually renting cars and driving that rental car to their family's house and pretending that it's theirs. Is that crazy? To try to be somebody that you're not so that you don't have to explain to your mom and dad that you might not be who they want you to be. We get pressure from our friends and family. We feel like we're being compared to other people all the time. If we're still trying to please man, then maybe we need to examine that. We're not a servant of Christ. We need to memorize that verse. Stop trying to get their approval. Stop trying to always look like them. Stop always doing matching pajamas on Christmas. But if you are, at least leave the dog out of it. I'm just kidding. But go easy on those crazy family members too. Everybody's got them. There's a reason for it though. Everybody's struggling with their own thing. We just don't know what it is. Maybe you're the crazy family member. That's what I tell myself. Maybe I'm that one. Try serving your spouse. Your spouse is struggling too, trying to meet up with everything and all of the demands. There's not enough affirmation in this world that only comes from Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can give us bottomless affirmation that we need. We need to spread the love of Jesus this holiday season. He is the only answer. He is the only one that we can find our identity in and be fully filled in it. So let's enjoy this Thanksgiving. Let's go out and affirm people as much as we possibly can and tell them who we can find our identity in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the never-ending love and affirmation that we need. Lord, I ask that people would find that in you. I ask that you would show us or show others that need it, that forgiveness and that compassion, and show us how to give that and to show that to people that are in need of it. Lord, thank you that we can rest assured that our identity is fully in you. You fill us up every day, Lord. I ask that we would, as we go forward this week and into Thanksgiving, Lord, that we would just find a, a special form of, of calm, and then as we're coming into this Christmas season, Lord, I ask that we would just not forget what it is about, that we would, that we would keep our eyes focused on you and not the busyness of the season. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand with us.
love God, love others, and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Have a great week, everybody.